So I'm, uh, I've come from the world of water and come to the world of arts a lot later in life. And I run a virtual museum online, which we started in 2017, with the idea of working with young people to uh, um, help them understand where their water comes from and where their water goes. So this means understanding the past in order to celebrate the future or you know, think about how we look at water in the context also of climate change. So very happy that some of the previous panels touched on issues like water, uh, ecologies, uh, gender and violence, and some of my co-panelists will come back to some of those topics in the course of their own practice. Next slide, please. So really, the, the, all of you who've lived and worked and traveled in India know the kind of issues we face with our water, right? I mean, we have monsoon rainfalls, we have uh, a huge and extensive coastline, we have a uh, really, really in-depth understanding of indigenous ways of looking at our water. We have community institutions that manage our local water resources. We have artists, musicians, dancers, etc. who sing, dance, play, tell stories around water. And yet, we have a crisis, right? And I'm not going to go into that crisis because we listen, we're here talking about how we look at this and how we interpret this through the medium of art as a virtual museum. Uh, I hope you've had some time to, to read the poem over here. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we, so basically we've been always affiliated with academic spaces. We were in Ahmedabad for three years, and uh, in 21 I moved to uh, Pune. And whilst we were in Ahmedabad, we worked very closely with uh, students from N NID the National Institute of uh, Design, and looking at how can we tell the story of step wells, these wonderful, amazing architectural uh, structures, seven to nine stories deep, crossing the semi-arid landscape of Gujarat, Rajasthan, right up into Central Asia, uh, you know, were built by women, many were built by women actually, and carried their names, they were seen as meritorious acts so that people provided water for all these community spaces. And yet, yet, many people don't even know that there is a step well in their backyard. And unfortunately, many of them, unless they've been preserved by ASI or have a UNESCO World Heritage tag, many of them have uh, become sites where people just throw rubbish into them. So this young boy called Brito created this fantasy future where a young girl, a bit like uh, Alice in Wonderland, falls down a well in a futuristic world in her search for water, and how she encounters this whole uh, rural-urban conflict over water that we see around us every day, and uh, how Munna has to find her, and basically these taps that you, you see at the, over here, these taps are uh, drawing water upwards to urbanization and development and all of that that's happening up there in the India that we know. So she has to negotiate her way out of this well by dealing with the oracles and all of that. So this was actually developed as a storyboard for an interactive game. Unfortunately, we don't have the resources and the technology to develop that, but I just think this is a very powerful story. Next slide. Uh, we've worked when the pandemic started, so we are, our main work is as a virtual, is as a virtual uh, repository, but we've also worked in physical spaces because you cannot call yourself a museum unless you find ways of engaging with your audience. And so we've done that many times through walks, through talks, through performance, etc. But when the pandemic started and we were all locked up, we decided to look at urban waterscapes so Confluence is the exhibition that we launched in 2021, which tells the history of uh, Bombay's waters, many types of waters, including public fountains, which many people don't know about. And these public fountains, again, built by philanthropists, provided by philanthropists, RCs, and even British, or whatever, 
now have been in many places in, replaced by um, smart ATMs or you know the mineral water bottle, etc. But many cities in India carry some form of free water, which anyone can access irrespective of uh, gender or caste or anything. Next one. And finally, I think through the museum and also because of my work around water on inclusion and equity and gender, it's been very, very important for us to find ways of talking about caste and water in India. So this is what uh, um, Ambedkar, the father of the Indian constitution, led 2,000 people from the scheduled caste community in a small village in Maharashtra to drink water from a public lake. And this incident, which happened many, uh, was you know, more than 40 years ago, is still today celebrated and venerated uh, by many communities. So when we've worked on any of these urban landscape, uh, urban waterscape exhibitions, we've ensured that we've worked with communities and people that come, that are marginalized. So we work with the Pani Huck Samiti, the water, right, water rights uh, uh, um, movement, uh, which talked about the rights of water for everyone, irrespective of whether they owned their house or not. And, um, and also one of the artists outside in, the, uh, in P6, represented by the Tark Gallery, uh, Parag, the, the whole exhibition that you see around dry fish in Paragistan. He's also done an amazing uh, cookbook of dry fish recipes, which we put on, online uh, using a software called Issue. And uh, Parag collected these recipes from uh, mothers and grandmothers, etc., in, in his community, in the Koli community. So I wanted to just share this because that's what we're all going to be talking about. I'm going to hand over to Victoria to talk a little bit about her work and then the other panelists. And then we're going to have a conversation and we'd like you also to join in that conversation, right? So Thank you. Uh, could I have my first slide, please? So I'm just going to show you these slides as a way of introduction to where I work and where I'm from. Um, I am Australian and I live in Melbourne in Australia. And uh, I'm the director of this museum which is called Tarawara Museum of Art. It was established by uh, private patrons, Mark and Eva Beeson, and it opened in 2003. Tarawara is a Woiwurrung word. It's an Aboriginal word which means slow moving waters. And uh, it's the, uh, it, just near the museum is a big bend in the Mira Run, which is the Yarra River. And uh, the theory is that the Aboriginal people called that area Tarawara because the water slows down. And when I started at the museum, lots of people commented on the view, but they could never remember the exhibitions that would see. So uh, I started to think about that view and think about the many layers of history that lie in the natural terrain around Tarawara. I am a settler Australian and I live on the land of an Aboriginal culture that goes back more than 65,000 years. And uh, Australia was colonised really rather recently when you look through the history of colonisation in this region. So we were colonised just over 200 years ago. Next slide. So you see this is a map of Victoria, uh, that's a map of Australia, and you see there uh, a reference to a place called Corrindirk. Corrindirk was an Aboriginal mission. It was a place where Aboriginal people were uh, forced to live between the years of 1865 and it closed in 1926. It was also home to one of Australia's most revered Aboriginal artists, William Barak, who uh, campaigned for the freedom of Aboriginal people in the state of Victoria. Next slide, please. So I've shown you the colonial map, but this is the Aboriginal map. This is the, all of the different Aboriginal languages that exist in the state of Victoria. So in Australia, we are in constant tension and dialogue and negotiation 
as uh, white settlers uh, with First Nations people. And because Corando is located so close to the museum, um, we've developed projects with them over the last 10 years and uh, really we now have a memorandum of understanding with the Corando community. Next slide. So we're doing a, an exhibition, project, webinar series, workshop series called the Soils Project. So we've talked about water, now I'm going to talk about soil. This is a project that's been started before the pandemic, and so it's very long, um, and it's in collaboration with the Van Arnhem Museum in Eindhoven and an activist group in Indonesia called Struggles for Sovereignty who are also looking at the impact of Dutch colonisation on climate change. And this is Uncle Dave Wandon, and he is a descendant of William Barak, who I showed in the previous slide. Uh, this is current of today, and Uncle Dave is uh, starting to plant plants that the indigenous people were, were using and uh, living from uh, many years ago. This, this is called Myrmong. So we see soil as um, the earth. Soil is something we all share, but soil is also very specific to place. And at Tarawara, we encourage artists and projects that are responsive to the site. And uh, we see soil as something that's also cultural. Soil is communal and shared, and soil is a symbol of spirituality as well. So um, it's just one of many, many projects we do at the museum that will be an exhibition later this year called the Soils Project. And it will then also have another iteration in the Netherlands the following year. Um, I think that's all I've got. Is there any more from me? That's it. So that's just a brief introduction and I'll pass on to the next person. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Victoria. Just wanted you, just before I pass on to Pooja, just say a little bit about yourself and how you got interested in this work. Well, I've been a curator uh, and for over 30 years, and uh, my first exhibition I ever curated was uh, an Australian art exhibition for the Indian Triennale in all places. <laughs> so I'm an old hand in a way with India, but I think being in such a vernant area uh, where there's many layers of country, um, I've become more and more interested to program the museum in terms of the effects of that landscape. Because that landscape has native bushland, it has viticulture, it has farming, um, the cows and the sheep have ruined the topsoil. So it's, it's, it's ever present. And many, many Australian artists now, as the International Arts are very interested in climate change, and um, we just want to work quite specific to site and place. I think being responsive to place is one of the most dynamic ways to work with the museum. Thank you so much, Victoria. Puja, do you want to pick up the mic? So Puja is the uh, executive head of the Jahangir Nicholson Art Foundation. Hi, good, uh, good evening. Uh, firstly, thank you, Charlene, for including me in this uh, panel amongst my distinguished co-panelists who all produce such inspiring and important curatorial work. Um, currently, I head the Jahangir Nicholson Art Foundation. We are a... Uh, stop at the slide for a second. Uh, we are a non-profit organization that holds the entire collection of Jahangir Nicholson who was one of the earliest private collectors of Indian art post-independence. The Jaggi Nicholson Art Foundation is housed inside the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vasco Sakrale, abbreviated to CSMDS. Um, so the museum is in Kalakura in Bombay. And we form the modern temporary art wing of the museum. So for a decade now, I have been engaged full-time in curatorial practice in museums in Bombay. Previously, I worked as a curator at the Dr. Bhav Rajinath Museum for about six and a half years. Uh, Pre-pandemic, the CSMBS Museum would receive about six lakhs, that's um, 600,000 visitors per year. So the audiences that come into the museum are very varied. They consist of a wide demographic ranging from locals, tourists from within the state, country, foreign tourists, families, 
and uh, all sorts of age groups. Um, so both the museums that I'm associated with are over a hundred years old. As the modern and contemporary wing of the museum, I see uh, JNF's role as poised to explore links between the past and the present. So curatorial practice for me is to uh, present exhibitions and programming that provide an opportunity to continue to explore our past and place in post-colonial India. Um, so this uh, exhibition that you see, the, the slide that you see now. Uh, so this is the first exhibition that I curated at the JNF, which was the first exhibition to uh, celebrate the museum centenary year, which was last year. And um, so just trying to uh, think of the programming for the centenary year, I wanted to curate uh, an exhibition uh, that would engage the public with the stories within the museum while also providing a space for simultaneous wonder, reflection, and critique of the process of history writing itself. Interestingly, the museum functioned as a military hospital during World War I and during the Spanish flu pandemic. So uh, at the time that I was planning this exhibition, we were, anyways, we, we ourselves were reeling from the recent pandemic. So to unpack these many sort of uh, you know, collate, or many sort of things that were happening that really and that had antecedents in the past uh, through history, I invited contemporary artist Sahaj Rahal, whose work conflates archaeology, science fiction, and video gaming, to uh, address the complex role that mythology and history uh, play in our current scenario. And, um, and I think that that is somewhere that, that's something that's very important right now for us as we are living in a society that is increasingly more opinionated and polarized. So I think it's important to try and find a space where you know people can come together and people who have very different opinions from us can also sort of express and sort of have a conversation, you know, which is becoming so hard nowadays. So those are the sort of questions that were going through my head when I was um, thinking of this exhibition. Um, so we planned this exhibition all the time that the museum was closed to the public. So we had quite a lot of time to uh, really think through things. And so uh, I invited say to do new site-specific works, which were from a current project that he was engaged in. He, was, he had actually drawn from the archaeological site of Inamgaon in Maharashtra. And also I chose some of uh, Sahaj's earlier works to present this very sort of immersive installation. So it was theatrical and uh, it, it basically is like a theater where you enter this make-believe crypt of a post-human uh, civilization, so to speak. So, um, so this was a very playful exhibition that explored the sort of porous boundaries between fact and fiction, and history as a subjective process. Um, so you can move on, you can move on to the next slide, please. Um, yeah, and you know, even the way that the exhibition sort of took shape was a collaborative process. There were many decisions that we made while putting it up. Um, uh, Sarah, in a previous conversation, had asked me to also speak about how you know, other sort of constituencies in the museum uh, affect uh, our process. So, uh, for instance, the security guards and all were very worried about the small little objects that were there in the, uh, uh, that were just placed on these open shelves. So from there, I said, okay, maybe we have to put the small objects in our vitrine. And so we started doing this and it kind of built a completely different miniature so tech site as well. Um, you can move on to the next slide. Um, yeah, this is just to show, since we're talking about curating for the public, these are all just uh, chance happenings that we managed to, uh, like lots of visitors who engaged with the, with, with the project. There was also an AI program which would respond to sound, and here we see some hand playing with uh, the shadow and the things. You can, you can keep moving move ahead. Um, yeah, these are just some of the Responses, I mean, if you come to the museum in the morning, there are sneaking lines of children and, um, you know, there are many times you go through walkthroughs or workshops and things. 
for this exhibition, we also invited uh, visitors to make their own labels, to tell their own stories. So it was sort of inviting people to be part of this process and not look at the museum as an intimidating space, which is only uh, where you are spoken at or told something, you know. It was also to sort of invite people to be part of this process, uh, understand and make their own stories. So um, uh, you can go to the next one. Um, so I never thought I would ever curate a Raza exhibition, honestly, mainly because one almost feels that one has seen enough and heard enough and you know there is a lot that's already been done with these artists. And I think that's the important thing when you're working with a collection, there are different sort of discoveries that you also make. There are also stakeholders and people that you know you have to like, program in accordingly. And uh, so for this exhibition, I wanted to present a different perspective not looking at the usual esoteric narratives of the Bindu and the spiritual in Raza's work, but rather to explore his landscapes through a conception of land, borders, nationhood and citizenship, which are all sort of very current, um, you know, political things also in our um, current scenario. And uh, while closely looking at uh, Raza's own migratory life, and effects of the historical events of partition, independence, and also to look at Raza as one of the first Indian diaspora artists. So looking at the idea of place through his own uh, sort of life. Now you can just move ahead to the next. Um, this is my last slide. From, um, so this is the latest exhibition which is currently on view, uh, which is titled, uh, it's an esteem of the exhibition titled The Vastness Again and Again. Um, so, the reason, how this exhibition actually came together because um, I was just thinking that the recent, um, Nasreen Mohammadi's recent astronomical rise to prominence internationally, somehow what comes across is, um, you know, Nasreen as this sad, tragic, neglected, lonely, forgotten sort of figure. However, she was an integral part of the artist fraternity both in Bombay and especially in Baroda, one witnesses Nasreen's presence long after she has gone, not only through her friends and colleagues, but more importantly through the lasting impact that her aesthetics and teaching have had on gen generations of students. So this exhibition explores the legacy through the art centers of Bombay and Baroda. Through works, uh, it also presents works by some of her peers and a lot of archival material. Um, and of course, a large body of work, some of which are being shown for the first time in her. Uh, this is also the first major retrospective of Nasreen Normandy's works in Mumbai since 1991, uh, where a retrospective was organized by her family just a year after she passed away. So um, I think I'll end here. And thank you for listening. I hope some of you can make it to Bombay and see our exhibition. Thank you. Uh, Pooja. Uh, I'm going to move on to Nancy and have her introduce her practice and what she does a little bit as well. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Charlene, for organizing this panel discussion. So, curating for the public, the first, uh, the first slide, please. Thank you. Contemporary art tends to alienate large sections of the viewing publics in India. They are alienated not only from its content, its history, techniques, and stance, but also from its institutionality and viewer protocols. And yet, despite the lack of proper pedagogy and mediation, our viewers continue to amaze us with their readiness to engage. Over the years, I have come to trust our, viewer, our viewers over any rhetoric about access or public participation. Here's Nirmala Morya, a security guard at the Serendipity Arts Festival in 2019, where I curated CCCC, Counter Canon, Counter Culture, Alternative Histories of Indian Art, an extensive research based show on the prehistory of new media art in India. She stands outside a video projection of Mani Kol's experimental film on Kashmir, Before My Eyes, made in 1988. 
Money Call was one of the core figures of the Transdisciplinary uh, Vision Exchange Workshop found, founded by Akbar Padam Singh in the late 60s. I show this film because it shares affinities with Padam Singh's metascapes. When the artist Sonia Kurana visited CCCC, Nirmala shared with her that it, this was her favorite work. Here is a sensorially rich film whose centerpiece is an alaf in Rag Shri, played on a cello in Drupad style. Drupad, one of the most austere and grand idioms of Hindustani classical music, is marked by a high level of sophistication. Rather than dumb down complexity or assume what can and cannot provoke our viewers, we need to be attentive to the power of art, which has the capacity to transcend social asymmetries. Next slide, please. In the run-up to counter-canon counterculture, the abrogation of Article 370 in Kashmir provoked me to place Money Call's heavily aestheticized film on Kashmir in dialogue with current Kashmiri voices that spoke directly to the urgencies of the moment. So I invited Alif to show its music video, Chehelamis, made in 2016, which alludes to the psychological trauma endured by the women of Kashmir who had to live with persistence, persistent violence since the late 1980s. Ram Rahman shared with me that his Kashmiri friends broke down and cried in front of Jehlamis. Never had the poetics of grief been demonstrated with such immediacy. And all of this transpired in a show that was, at its core, a scholarly archival inquiry. Next slide, please. Woman is as Woman Does, which I curated last year at CSMBS JNAF, was an intergenerational mapping of five generations of women artists. I did not want to make a show that privileged the anglophone women artists, which is the norm. As a corrective, women artists want to privilege were shown alongside those of Dalit or Adivasi origin. Such adjacencies between women artists of different social and cultural capital are rarely, if ever, scripted in Indian exhibition history. Next slide, please. I exhibited Shiva Chachi's photographs documenting the women's movement alongside Ranjita Kumari's Gali. Okay, next slide, please. I think there is. Uh, no, the next slide, please. Yeah, this one. I exhibited Shiva Chachi's photographs documenting the women's movement, movement alongside Ranjita Kumari's video Gali Geet. Gali Geet celebrates the transgressive songs from Bihar, traditionally sung by women, composed in Bhojpuri and Magahi, and associated with the region's Dalit community to which the artist belongs. Next slide, please. You have to go back. Back, please. That's the one. I showed Ranjita's works in turn next to Durga Bai Vyam's illustrations from the Bhimayan, a biography of Dr. Ambedkar. We have here Durga Bai, an artist of Adivasi heritage, demonstrating solidarity with the Dalit cause and articulating an intersectional feminism. Next slide, please. From the historical archive of the 1980s phase of the Indian women's movement, we segue into another form of archiving. The recording of period pain by Arshi Irshad, Irshad Ahmedzai. This is an example of what I have described as a visceral archive to which I should return in the discussion. The customary understanding of museum pedagogy is that it should be expository and explanatory in nature. This docental approach, to, so to speak, runs the risk of flattening out the many layered significance of an artwork. While the aim may be to advance the legibility of an artwork, what we should really be conveying is an education in the legibility of ambiguity. How to read polysemy, the multivalence of images and narratives. To further clarify, 
art exceeds interpretation. There is, thus, it is no use creating a pedagogy that is premised on a, sim on a simple transfer of meaning. Instead, I see the role of the curator as that of a sutradhar, who places the threads of interpretation into the hands of the viewer to make legible the ambiguity of the artwork. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Accordingly, I end with Mithu Sen's use of gibberish as a form of linguistic and performative resistance. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Nancy. That was very, very strong um, images and strong words. So I'm going to, I just have a few questions for the panelists, but, and then we'll open it up to the floor as well. So let me start with you, uh, Victoria, because you talked about your work with uh, First Nation artists in Australia, that it's so important to, there are so many layers of history, politics, art, environment, ecologies, etc., that you um, negotiate to, to do that kind of art, you know? And I was wondering um, how, in your own work, in your own practice, how have you negotiated some of these institutional spaces? What have been some of the challenges that you faced? And um, you know, we we talked in our in our Zoom meetings about the misuse of words and things like empowerment and, and empowering communities and empowering um, Aboriginal communities and, and all of that. But you know, when I started my work on gender empowerment, was an important word for us 30 years ago. Not so anymore in the Yield State using the same terminology of empowerment. So. Wanted you to reflect a bit on that. Um, the the first thing I would say is that uh, the biggest challenge with working with artists of the First Nations background is trust and uh, finding ways to get them to trust the institution and the practitioners within that institution, and it takes many, many, many years. So it's taken 10 years for us to even get this memorandum of understanding with the Wonder and Aboriginal Corporation in our area. And I think the thing that I've learned the most about working with First Nations artists is the um, act of listening. To actually not say anything, to not uh, propose an authoritative point of view over the discourse that is, is being said, or the yarn, as the um, as a lot of Aboriginal people would like to call it, the chat. And I'll just read out um, something that the ba Bakaji woman, um, scientist and academic Zina Comston has said, and it's something her uncle told her, which is to learn about our world and to continue our culture, we must have access to country, to walk and to sit with our elders to learn through carefully observing, listening, seeing, talking, smelling, and tasting. This is an experiential learning, and it puts what you are learning into your body and mind in a way that writing things down, removed from the source or the classroom, cannot. So it is, this, it's for, for someone like me, it is about listening, and for the Aboriginal First Nations artists that we work with, and participants and collaborators. It's about, it is about empowering them, and I still think empowering is an important word, and empowering their voices and allowing them to determine how they want to be. We can't be extractive in the way that we show art from First Nations people. Uh, we can't uh, simply represent. We need them to be able to say how they want to be in a place like Tarawara Museum of Art. Um, and it's such a it's such a, a rich and engaging process. In terms of diversity, Australia is one of the most diverse countries in the world. I think fifty percent of people were either born outside the country or have a parent who was born outside the country. So it's a very strong multicultural society that sits alongside 
um, the First Nations people who, are, who have not been treated well at all. But having said that, there is a lot of pressure now to speak to those diverse publics, and those diverse publics are not necessarily seeing themselves in our museums, even in exhibitions of contemporary art. I've worked with this in a still forever, um, but it is still kind of relatively new in Australia, and there is quite a lot of work being done now to find ways to communicate with people from diverse backgrounds or from a disabled background as well. Um, so yeah, those are some of the, the challenges that we've got at the moment. But I think listening is key.